Okay, we have another, um, we have a presentation from Immutable from Robbie Ferguson. Very excited to have you back. Thank you. Thanks. Is this on? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very fortunate to be here today. Uh, actually, not just because of this, but I had the worst Uber driver, and I thought I was going to die on the way here, so I'm actually quite grateful. Um, so for those of you who don't know me or what Immutable does, I'm Robbie Ferguson. I co-founded Immutable. Uh, we are the leading layer two platform powering the next generation of Web3 games. We started out by building the first ever multiplayer game on the blockchain back in December 2017. The entire thing was on chain and I don't recommend it. You can play around now and it'll cost you 6,000 US dollars in gas fees. And so we learned a lot from the early days about what the limitations of scale was restricting in terms of game design. But the really interesting thing is now, at the precipice of unlocking scale and at the $8 billion that have been invested into Web3 games over the past 18 months, what we're really looking at is a revolution in games that we have not seen before and a forcing function where the next games that come out over the next 12 to 24 months will have hits that use new game design techniques, paradigms, and incentive alignments that have before not been seen in the gaming industry. So I'm really, really excited to share about what I think is going to be significant, and also some of the fundamental principles that we need to solve in order to truly unlock this, this next generation of sort of Web3 games. I wanted to start things off with first principles. Why does this matter in the first place? Why should this exist? What can you tell your friends when they say NFT gaming is a scam? And the basics is gaming itself as an industry is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in the entire planet. It's bigger than film, TV and music combined. And of that, gamers spend $100 billion every single year on in-game items that they have zero rights to. And we think that's a scam. Because you should be able to have the same property rights to what you have in the real and physical world. And if you look at the investment off the basis of that in Web3 games, we've had $8 billion poured into Web3 games over the past 18 months. This is literally unprecedented in the gaming VC market in total, let alone a niche or vertical inside of it. In fact, in 2020, it's doubled the entire gaming VC market, and that includes those Web3 investments. So why do people actually care about Web3 games? Well, if you look at the three fundamental things that games succeed or die by, they live or die by, it is what is your user acquisition cost? What is your cost of acquisition? What is your retention? How long do players stick around? And what is your monetization? How much do they want to spend? And if we drill into each of these fundamentals, which we do all the time with games companies, we want to understand not just why is this better for players, but why does this create a credible business model for publishers? It's very, very simple. You can acquire users more cheaply because you have the brand new and most powerful UA tool we've ever seen which is actually giving players true value for playing your game in the first place. And what we specialize in is not just creating a, a sort of pump or Ponzi scheme which is going to eventually collapse, it's how do you back the assets that you're giving out to players with the demand that is gonna be created through those incentives. The second thing is retention. And the really magical thing is when you give players ownership of your game via assets, they will stick around far higher than any other thing. They become a co-owner. They become part of this cooperative. And it is actually their equity that they're playing with when they play in that game, which is incredibly powerful. And finally, how do we actually increase distribution monetization? Well, one of the most powerful methods is, for the first time ever, we can actually pay streamers through a method other than patronage or donations, which is one of the most ridiculous monetization models. I mean, it's literally how we pay bards in the 1800s by barons. And now we can say, through the power of provenance or digital merchandise, hey, the exact skin that Ninja used to win a Fortnite tournament, he can auction. And all of the added value that his provenance has brought to that asset is value that he keeps. Incentive aligning the distributors of games with the people who are playing and actually bringing value to those games. But that's just the fundamentals. Why should we actually be excited about the next generation of game design principles and fun that Web3 games can unlock? So here's six general ideas to go over. And I think we are going to face the most exciting decade of gaming that we have ever seen. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is changes to AI. AI and advancements in technology are democratizing game production. And that's not some BS buzzword of democratization. It is meaning that developers can, faster and cheaper than ever, create games that are fun to play. It is meaning that 
Literally, a mom of two in Manticore became a famous developer of 3D models of tanks. It is empowering everyday creators to create the content that people want to use inside these games. And what we need is a way for that value to be organized and those creators to be empowered. And that is precisely what Web3 has specialized and proved it is better than any other solution we've come up to date with in the world. We also have advancements in AI. That means you can create 3D models or images. If you've been following me on Twitter, I excitedly got access to uh, OpenAI's DALI, which is the image generative network on, on uh, OpenAI's neural net protocol that was released a few weeks ago. And this thing is literally magic. You can type in, I want to see a photo of a dragon wearing a wizard's hat casting a spell on Mars, and it'll generate it. And this is just what's available in 2022. Very soon it'll be, you can make cards for trading card games. You can make 3D models for worlds. You can have assets dynamically generated by anyone who doesn't even need anything other than a creative vision for what they're building. And what this does is it unlocks the next billion people who are non-technical to start being creators and authors of what people want to play with in games. So I'm really excited about that and how that impacts Web3 because it means each of them can actually own and make money and have proper incentives to build universes out of this content. The second thing is where we've removed the restriction for the first time ever on scale. Um, and I, I want to kind of, when you look at NFTs today and anyone thinks about them, you really think of them as Veblen or luxury goods. It's the $66 million Beeple. It is the 400,000 or a bit less now Bored Ape or CryptoPunk. It is the NFTs that people want to buy and, and have as luxury assets. And even in gaming to date, a lot of the assets that have been sold have been premium value assets, which is fine. They absolutely have a place in the industry. But the trends that we're going to see is they'll move from Veblen goods to sustainable gaming economies with hundreds of millions of players and billions of transactions on a daily basis. Because this is about how do we allow people to earn items in game that they can trade for one or two dollars, that they can actually have real value from, while still allowing people to be running an economy in the game or a guild maker if they want it. And we now have the scale to do that. Obviously, Immutable is specializing as a layer two in how can we achieve today more than 10,000 transactions per second, but with our cross roll up liquidity platform, millions. And this unlocks truly planet scale for if World of Warcraft and you know, uh, another major game today wanted to use Web3, they literally couldn't on any scaling infrastructure. This is what's needed to take it to the next level. The third is financialization. Uh, so one of my favorite things about researching sort of the, the trends in finance is that any sufficiently liquid or high volume enough secondary market has index funds and futures and all sorts of derivative products built on top of it. Literally, uh, pork knuckle, um, has, a, has a futures market for it because there's sufficient primary demand. And so when you look at a hundred billion dollar a year industry, it is very clear that you know, five or 10 years from now, there will literally be a trading desk at Goldman Sachs or other trading firms where they trade assets inside video games. And maybe you say you want to go long on the John Wick collection of Fortnite skins, but you're going short on you know, coins inside sort of match three games because you actually think that genre is in decline. And we're going to see these meta economies and financial institutions actually making bets on what sort of content they think that users will play. And as soon as you have bets, you suddenly have a predictive market. So we're going to have a financial market predicting what are the next trends and genres of what kind of content players want to play. Everything from MOBAs versus RPGs to inside those games, do people want to main you know, a, a support or a top laner in League of Legends? And the new emergent game design principles that this brings out is going to be fascinating. The fourth is new game design principles. One of my favorite and most unexpected inventions in Web3 today has been the guild. It is incredible that we have now replaced the idea of a game company going out and paying $100 million to Google to show ads to customers to now there is an emergent group of hundreds of thousands of people in a guild, and they say, we're going to search for our favorite games, and if we like them, we're going to buy tokens inside of it and play it. That is permissionless marketing, and it is market-driven finding the most exciting content out there. So I'm incredibly excited about how guilds can actually support a whole new plethora of content. And in general, what we're going to see is they will be far more viable to make a game as an indie dev, which is a good reversal to the trend of the last decade of consolidation, where everything is being big acquisitions by game studios. Hey, come work on Call of Duty, come work on main titles. And I'm really excited for the diversity of indie content that is being enabled by Web3. The thing I want to leave with is 
all of this stuff is awesome, but the most important thing is we are reinventing the way that incentives in the gaming industry has worked. For a very, very long time, gamers have extracted value at the expense of their players. Their entire goal has been how do we get them to spend more while having nothing? How do we take Call of Duty and make sure the next version gives them zero value that they've worked on for thousands of hours in the previous instance of the game because we make more money? We can now present a model where the best and most successful games must be fundamentally incentive aligned with their players. They must create a long-term economy which has maximized value over time in order to be successful. Um, I'm incredibly excited for that pro player future. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Robbie. Really appreciate it.